Okay, well, hello, everybody. Um, my name is Elena Brokaw. I am the Barbara Bernard Smith Executive Director at the Museum of Ventura County, and we are delighted to, I guess, not see you, but to have you here this evening um, for the third installment of Behind the Scenes with Ivor Davis. I would like to say, I think you all know this is a members only event and it is made possible by Wagner Financial and, and frankly by you. So we're so happy to be able to do this. We would not be able to do it without the incomparable Ivor Davis. I've looked at the participants and I see some return um, names and some new names and it is, it's just so great to see um, people that I run into on the streets occasionally all masked to have you here tonight. So without further ado, uh, we're going to be together for about an hour and I'm going to turn it over to Ivor now. Okay, good evening everyone. Thank you Elena, thank you Denise Sindela for your support. Uh, thank you in advance to Jonathan McGee and Eric Knight for their behind the scenes magic. Okay, um, I just want to say that I hope for the next hour you will escape from our twilight zone of a world that we find ourselves in and enjoy Hollywood in Wonderland or something like that. Now, before we talk about Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, I would like to sidetrack very slightly. Now, most of you know that Paul Newman was one of the most famous actors in Hollywood history. His films were legend, uh, Cool Hand Luke, Somebody Up There Likes Me, The Hustler. His acting career in film and television and on stage spanned over 50 years. He was a Best Actor Oscar winner in 1986 for his role as Fast or Fast Eddie Felsen in The Color of Money. Of course, that was opposite Tom Cruise. It was a sequel to The Hustler. And he finally won that Oscar after seven nominations. Okay, Newman also won two Golden Globes for Best Director for Rachel Rachel and Best Actor in a Supporting Role in the TV series Empire Falls, as well as a slew of special awards for his contributions to Hollywood. Now, in my career writing for the London Daily Express and for the New York Times Syndicate, I interviewed many celebrities, and I'm currently working on a book telling inside stories about some of those celebrities, particularly the ones I've interviewed. It's, I've, I've done it for over half a century, but I mention this because I mentioned that to my son Gideon, who cynically said, yeah, dad, great idea, but nobody knows who Paul Newman is. Well, I said, you don't know what you're talking about. Now, as most of you know, Paul Newman is no slouch. So last year, hoping to prove my son wrong, I asked a class at Ventura College where I was a guest lecturer this question. When I mention the name Paul Newman, what does it mean to you? There was total silence and they all looked a little blank, would you believe? And then finally, a young lady put her hand up and she said to me, doesn't he make salad dressing? Of course he does. Now, if Paul Newman was alive today, I know he would smile at that answer because some years ago, I went to his office to do an interview. Hanging on the wall was a framed letter from a man in California who gushed about Newman's own salad dressing. And the letter read, my girlfriend mentioned that you were a movie star. So I would be interested to know what films you've made, because if you act as well as you cook, then your movies just might be worth watching. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about this classic, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. The 1969 movie, uh, an offbeat Western, was written by William Goldman and directed by George Roy Hill. It was loosely based on fact. And the film tells the story of 
Wild West outlaws Robert Leroy Parker, known as Butch Cassidy, Paul Newman, and his partner, Harry Longbow, the Sundance Kid, played by Robert Redford. They are on the run from a crack of US posse after a string of train robberies. The pair, along with Sundance's lover, Etta Place, played by Catherine Ross, flee to Bolivia in search of more successful criminal capers. Now, according to the Oscar-winning writer Goldman, when he first wrote the script and sent it out for consideration, only one studio wanted to buy it. And that was with the proviso that the two lead characters did not flee to South America. Now, when Goldman protested that actually it happened, that was a story, the studio head responded, I don't give a damn, all I know is John Wayne don't run away. So Goldman wrote, rewrote the script and said he didn't change it more than a few pages and subsequently he found that every studio in Hollywood wanted to make it. Now, the other thing is that the Sundance Kid, believe it or not, was first offered to Jack Lemon, whose production company had produced the film Cool Hand Luke in 1967, starring Newman. Lemon, however, turned down the role because he didn't like riding horses. Other actors considered for the role of Sundance were Steve McQueen and Warren Beatty, who both turned it down. Beatty claiming that the film was too similar to his movie, Bonnie and Clyde. And according to the writer Goldman, McQueen and Newman both read the scripts at the same time and agreed to do the film. But McQueen, who had a reputation for being quixotic and a bit of a difficult character, eventually backed out due to a disagreement with Newman. But the two actors kissed and made up later and eventually teamed up in the 1974 disaster film, The Towering Inferno. Now, tonight, here's my not very important information fact number one. You know, I always find it fascinating to think of actors in Hollywood who turn down certain roles. Remember The Graduate? Well, director Mike Nichols tried to get Robert Redford for the title role, and then, of course, as everybody knows, he settled for Dustin Hoffman. And who will ever forget The Godfather and Marlon Brando? Well, would you believe that Jack Nicholson said, no thanks? And did you hear that before Sean Connery accepted the role of the suave and debonair martini drinking British agent 007 James Bond, the role was turned down by Elvis Presley. No, sorry, I was kidding about that one. That was complete fiction. I said it just to make sure you're all awake. Now, Jonathan, please, would you kindly show us the trailer of our movie that stars that guy who makes salad dressing? Thank you. Well, aren't those, aren't those trailers marvelous? Um, Elena, I hope you can, you can, you can hear me okay. Um, you, you mentioned something uh, before we came on about uh, the, the new rules of movie trailers, because the old ones, sometimes, I mean, they just gave you everything and it wasn't even worth seeing the movie. But what was, what was it you said about the, 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 the commandment of trailers? I, so it's very important that everybody know this, that now movie trailers cannot be longer than two and a half minutes, except every studio can have one trailer per year that exceeds that length. So, because I don't know about the rest of you, but when I go to, I love movie previews, as I call them, but they can go on a bit long. So there you go. All right, well, let's talk about you and this uh, movie and the stars in this movie, Ivor. So. Some of you who are here with this in this talk with us today were here with us last time when we talked about Bobby, uh, which 
you know, we talked about the movie, but we talked about it because Ivor, you were there on the night when Bobby Kennedy was assassinated, which was in 1968. And this movie came out in 1969. So the timing for where you were, when you were on the tour with Bobby Kennedy and on the site of this movie must have been very close. Is that right? Yes, it was. It was very close. Um, and the interesting thing is that, um, I'll just tell you this, I had met uh, well, let me start again. I went to see Paul Newman in 1968 because it was an election year. And Paul Newman was a high profile supporter of Senator Eugene McCarthy, who was running opposite Bobby Kennedy for the Democratic nomination. And of course, they, they began, they ran because LBJ pulled out and it was a Vietnam War. But so it was kind of a double edged thing um, Elena, that, so I went to see Paul Newman, but I'd met him before, and and I suddenly remembered this, but I met him two years earlier when, um, because I wrote for a London newspaper, I got a call from a famous film director, and this is my only impersonation of the famous film director, see if you can guess who it is. Hello, Ivor, I'd like you to come and see my movie, Torn <laughs> Curtain. It's a terrific film, and I'd like to introduce you to Julie Andrews and the young American Paul Newman. Okay, enough. Okay, it is a I'll great. Keep my, I'll keep my day job. But 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 physic, you know, your body type, not at all, not, not at, at all. all. Okay, well, if those of us who thought, well, you know, was that uh, Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh? It wasn't. It was uh, actually Alfred Hitchcock. So I met uh, Julie Andrews and Paul Newman on this film, which does not go down Torn Curtain in the history of great movies. I don't think so. And I don't think if anybody is anybody out there in the, in the netherworld that I'm talking to, please raise your hands if you saw Torn Curtain. Uh, I th what, two? Oh my God, two of you. Okay, we'll take a poll uh, later on. So I went along with my late wife, Sally, to Mexico, to see, actually talk to Paul Newman about why he was supporting, uh, very strongly supporting uh, a Democratic candidate. Now, I should say that uh, at the time, uh, Newman was very dedicated about his political support. Um, and he was so dedicated and so high, high profile that Richard Nixon had him on his enemy list, would you believe? But I think he was 19th, but they still, you know, he was on the list. And he supported uh, Mr. Senator uh, McCarthy. So off I went to Mexico um, to, see, um, to see Paul Newman. Um, Paul was quite charming. And I want to tell you, I, um, I just had a mental block on the name of the, uh, the, name of the city, but it'll come to me in a few moments. And, and so Newman greeted me very warmly. We talked about politics, and I was there for a few days where I saw the, the film being shot. Now, um, I should tell you that I got on very well with Paul Newman. And one of the reasons I got on well with him, and I hate to admit it, but this is what happened. After we did the interview, um, we were staying in this very charming hotel, which was like the Beverly Hills Hotel in the middle of, of nowhere. Um, but it was lovely. And he ordered a bottle of French brandy. And we had a long conversation about politics. And as the night wore on, I forgot exactly what he had to say, but it was obviously very important because we finished the brandy. And I, I remember this vividly because those of you out there who've drunk a bottle of good French brandy, and even though I was much younger, the effect was pretty devastating because I returned to my little suite at this hotel um, in, in, in Cuernavaca and Las Mañanitas was the name of the hotel and it had wonderful um, um, birds walking around wildly making terrible noises. Now when you have drunk half a bottle of brandy and birds are screaming I finished up the night on my knees in the bathroom. I woke up the next day 
with a monumental hangover. I staggered to the film set and Paul Newman, who drunk more than I had, was looking, well, he looked fresh, bright, dazzling. And I said to him, I feel pretty sick even today. And he said, what you should do, he said, is when you've drunk too much, the next morning, get into the sauna and sweat it out of your system. So ever since, and I, you know, every frequently I go out and get drunk, I find the nearest sauna and thanks to Paul Newman, I can recover. But I must tell you, I don't want to go on too long about that, but, but it was fun on the film set. And uh, there was Catherine Ross with the co-star and we knew that she was having a secret fling with Conrad Hall who was the cinematographer, the Oscar-winning cinematographer on the film. It was supposed to be secret, but I mean, everybody knew what was going on. And the other rather quirky thing that I learned later on, that was there was a, a, an actor on the film who had a very small role in it called Sam Elliott. And Sam Elliott, and you, everybody knows him, he's got that deep, rich, baritone voice. I think he's making a lot of money doing commercials. Sam Elliott said that the moment he set eyes on Catherine Ross, he fell in love with her. But of course he was an unknown and, he, and it wasn't until 1984 that he fa finally met her again and married her. So Sam met Kath Catherine Ross on that film and then years later he proposed to her and she married him and she's still married to him. In fact, um, Sam is, uh, is 76 and um and his wife is 80 and they live in malibu uh, and so that was some of the things that were going on um again I, I know that you want to ask a question but one of the things that was, was was also fascinating was that paul introduced us to his children who were on the set with him joanne woodward wasn't with him he introduced us to the kids and they were charming. The girls were quite young, eight, nine. His son, Scott, was about 12, 13, or a bit in his teens. And, and he said, and I was very impressed with this. He said, you're going into town. He said, you come from Hollywood, but be nice to the people. You know, get to know them. Don't be Hollywood brats. And I thought that was kind of interesting. Uh, the tragic thing was that some people know that Scott, when he was in his 20s, uh, late 20s, I think, uh, died of a, a, an overdose of drugs. And, um, and that was a, a, one of the tragedies that, uh, that, that, that actually happened. Anyway, so that's, uh, I know, go ahead with any other questions, please, Elena, and I've gone a bit. Well, I know we have another um, little bit uh, with some words from the director of the yes. movie. Maybe we could look at that and then we'll go on with some more questions. So Jonathan, if you're ready, why don't you cue that up? Did, did you know he referred to um, Redford as a, a hard-nosed Mick? I always thought that meant uh, an Irishman, but I didn't know that um, that Redford was an Irishman. Anybody out there who may be doing the question and answer session could tell me if Robert Redford was an Irishman. Anyway, sorry, go ahead, Elena. No, I, I, I mean, it's so interesting to hear him talk, to, to hear the director, George Roy Hill, talk in that bit about the relationship between them because their chemistry is amazing in that movie. I think the first time I saw that movie was about 40 years ago. It wasn't when it first came out, but I remember it so well. And then it came to life again when I watched it yesterday. But so a question for me is, did you ever meet the director, George Roy Hill, or was your, your focus when you were there so different from the film that you didn't get to interact with him? Well, I didn't interview George Roy Hill, but, um, but as, as movie aficionados know, um, George Roy Hill brought them together again, and I met him briefly when they shot a movie called The Sting. Um, and so that magic that he was talking about, the camaraderie, uh, worked so well in that film, worked so well in The Sting. 
which was a terrific film about these two guys who um, who end up conning a, a mobster played by the uh, uh, British Irish actor Robert Shaw. Mm -hmm. And I forget the year, but I went along to see Redford and Newman again on the film because they I remember it vividly because they shot many of the scenes on the Santa Monica Pier and using the funfair uh, scenery that was already established on the Santa Monica Pier for the movie The Sting. So that was, um, I, I, you know, and then, and then of course, um, I, I did see Newman a uh, Newman a bit later. And um, go ahead, I know you, you, you have um, some other questions. Well, I, I actually want to talk about Robert Redford because I'm female. And who doesn't, what, what among females, who amongst you doesn't want to talk about him? So at that time, I think he was not a big star. I think he'd been in a bunch of TV and he'd been in Barefoot in the Park, the Neil Simon uh, uh, play turned into a movie with Jane Fonda and maybe one other thing. But you, do you remember um, meeting Robert Redford and was there a wow factor for you? What was that like? Well, here's what happened. Uh, I had gone out to interview only Paul Newman. And after the first day, there was a guy from Fox Studios, a character called Jet Four, who was the publicist on the film. And he took me aside and he said, would you do me a big favor? He said, the co-star on this film is a great guy, but nobody has asked to talk to him. He said, it would, you know, you'd, I'd be forever indebted to you if you would mind talking to Bob Redford. And he said, look, you don't even have to put any tape in your tape recorder, but they're ignoring him. And would you talk to him? Well, of course, who could resist? But he was charming. Um, he told me that he just finished a film called Downhill Racer. Um, and as you said a moment ago, I knew he'd made Barefoot in the Park. And and, uh, and 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 downhill racer, which was a skiing movie, because it was he said his passion was skiing. Of course, it was. And um, talk about downhill racer. Here's my next not very important fact. Now, in downhill racer, a young actor made his debut in a very tiny role in that film. He played a guy in the bar, and the guy who played the guy in the bar was. Sylvester Stallone. So this is a piece of information that is totally useless, but I couldn't resist throwing it in. Now, let me go on about Redford. I went to see him again on several movies. And as I said, in 1973, he was in The Sting, which was a, a, a terrific film. And then I went to see him in, in, um, in Las Vegas when he was shooting a movie, I think it was in 1979, called The Electric Horseman. Um, Redford starred opposite Jane Fonda, who was the actress he starred opposite in the movie you just mentioned, which was Barefoot in the Park. Um, and, um, and I want to tell you that then, of course, Redford made a movie that is so powerful, it won him Best Director and Best Film called Ordinary People. Remember that film? It was a superb film. I think it was based on a novel. It starred Mary Tyler Moore in a very dramatic role, uh, Donald Sutherland and Tim Hutton, who won a Best Supporting Actor for that. But you know, what I vividly remember about Redford was seeing him in the 1990 movie Havana. Now, we saw it on a giant screen and I was shocked because the boyish Redford was now grizzled and all that skiing in the sun suddenly showed. Um, but anyway, he was looking older, can you believe? Now today Redford is pretty much retired. I think he's now 84, would you believe, 84. Of course, an environmental activist. And of course he founded the prestigious Sundance Film Festival. And sadly, Elena, I don't know if you saw a couple of days ago, his 58-year-old uh, son, James, died of cancer. So um, Redford is a legend, um, obviously a great, a great actor, a great director. 
And I was talking to a friend of mine and she said, you know, both Paul Newman and Bob Redford um, were lady killers. And I said, well, I'm sure that's right. I mean, that doesn't, doesn't surprise me. Doesn't surprise me at all. Anyway, so that's, that's um, it. And so, talking, go, I, I, I'm sorry, I, I'm talking about lady killers, of course, the, 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 the woman that he enticed into his arms, now we're back from Robert Redford to Paul Newman, was his wife, the brilliant actress, Joanne Woodward. And um, she was not on the film set of Butch Cassidy, but then I saw them a great deal um, on uh, other, other film sets when he directed her in movies. And in, in preparation for this little gathering, um, I found an interview I did with Paul Newman um, when he was working on a film, and I think it was called The Shadow Box. And um, so, he, so, so I must tell you, oh, by the way, I've got, to, I've got to tell you the most number three fact that you couldn't care less about, but I'm going to tell it to you because it involves the young Paul Newman. Now, I don't know if anybody remembers, but in 1954, he made a very forgettable, forgettable, sorry, forgettable biblical epic called The Silver Chalice. Now, he played a character in that film called, you ready? Basil the Painter. I mean, come on, Paul Newman playing Basil the Painter? Anyway, that was it. His co-stars were Pierre Angeli, Jack Palance, and an unknown actress named Natalie Wood. Now, Newman was always a very moral character and he hated the film. He hated it so much that when it came out on television, he took at his own expense, trade paper ads apologizing for it, apologizing for that first movie. And surprise, surprise, it was a smash hit on the telly. And, and Newman was nominated by the Hollywood Foreign Press as the most promising newcomer. Now, as I said, my interview with Paul was done on the 1980 TV movie called Shadow Box based on the more Broadway play by Michael Christopher. They shot it in Malibu. Joanne starred in it, Paul directed, and he stayed firmly behind the camera. And if I may for a moment tell you, here's what he told me. Question, do you watch any of your old films? Answer, I avoid them like the plague. Question, how you explain your enduring appeal? Answer, maybe I've been lucky enough to be in lots of films that were really well made. Question, how are you coping with getting older? Sorry, would you repeat that question? I'm getting half deaf and I have a memory like a sieve. Question, what's the secret of your long marriage? By the way, their marriage lasted for more than 50 years, Paul died in 2008 at the age of 83, and Joanne just turned 90. And of course, they made a lot of movies together. Now, here's the answer to the question about long marriage. Answer, I don't know what she puts into my food, he laughs. I always say this, I'm diesel fuel and she's high octane. But she's a great dame, and I sometimes wonder how she's managed to tolerate me for all these years. He went on, the late actor, Roddy McDowell, once asked her why she stayed with me so long. And Joanne told him it was because I made her laugh. At the time, I wasn't sure whether I should be offended, but now I realize laughter and joy has always been the glue in our relationship. So that was Paul talking about his wife, Joanne. Very moving. Oh no, that's wonderful. <clears throat> oh, you know, I'm sorry, I just suddenly remembered something and I know you have a question and we want some questions, but a few years later, talking about diesel fuel and all the rest of it, 
A few years later, I went to Bonneville Salt Lake Flats in Utah because Paul Newman, as many people who know his career, was a passionate racing car driver. Now, he'd gone to Bonneville Salt Flats in Utah to try and beat the land speed record set up by an Englishman called Donald Campbell. And Paul was, as I say, passionate about racing. Now, when I got there, he said, hello, and then he ignored me. And I thought, I wonder what I did. Maybe he, he, he's concerned that I'll bring a bottle of brandy uh, while he's trying to break the land speed record. Anyway, so I spoke to Warren Cowan, and Warren said, look, Paul is very serious about his racing career. It's not just a hobby, he's passionate about it. He said, you being here is a distraction, to be honest, and so Paul just wants to concentrate on getting behind the wheel and trying to beat that world record. And of course, he did try to beat the world record, but he didn't. And so that explained why he was a little bit cool after we had uh, shared a, a great bottle of uh, Courvoisier together, which I think he paid for, but that's another story. Um, anyway, so that was my meeting with him on, on the Salt Lake Flax in Utah, where he ignored me completely. Did Sorry, you go ahead, any other question? Did you run into him a lot after Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid? I mean, did he? I, I did, I did, because he was always a good interview. Uh, Joanne was a great interview. In later years, he made, he directed a lot of, um, um, a, a lot of television stuff. He loved to direct. And um, he, could, he could get behind the camera and he didn't have to be in front of the camera. So I saw him on several movies. I saw the, some of the daughters who worked on his film. He was very much a family man. He would bring his daughters along to be either small roles in the film or, or be technical people. So over the years I did, and I think the last time I saw him was when he promoted a thing called Empire Falls. And then a few years later, I can't remember the year of that, a few years later, unfortunately, he died. And uh, oh, oh, by the way, I forgot to say, I can attest that he had the bluest blue eyes in all of Hollywood. Wait, 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 wait. Did you ever meet Frank Sinatra? I did meet Frank Sinatra. Okay. Blue so Eyes himself, yeah. Yeah, exactly. But, but don't forget, Frank Sinatra, by the time I met him, was showing the wear and tear of his um, uh, imbibing. And I saw Frank Sinatra, I must tell you, when he, when I brought a bunch of readers from my newspaper from England to see his farewell concert in Las Vegas. Sinatra was fantastic. Sinatra was charming. Frank, you know, was charming. Can you believe that? And we went backstage. This was his final concert. It was, he was wonderful. He met all the people from England that I introduced to him, had his picture taken. And then the next year, he had another farewell concert. <laughs> yeah. He's no dummy. No. <laughs> Okay, so I think we want to get to questions, and yes. I know there are some out there, but I, I have one final question. And um, so I can't speak for everybody who's on this call, but for me, I've never been on a movie set. I don't know what it's like to be on a movie set. I can only imagine. Um, but you've been on many. And in this case, because this movie is so beloved, particularly for a, a generations yeah. you know, older, my kid who's nine, he's never heard of it. But did you have any sense of the magic that was being created while you were there? And, and is there something that you've noticed on your movie sets that, that tells you if it's gonna be a hit or not a hit? It's very difficult. Um, uh, I went on the movie set for Raise the Titanic in Greece and uh, the film sunk like a, a lead balloon. Um, and I've been on film sets with the, um, Blake Edwards, very funny film sets. And the scenes didn't look that funny at the time, but when they made the movie and finished the movie, it was terrific. So the answer to your question is, I, I, I mean, the camaraderie, the way, the sort of casual way they were uh, on the film of Butch Cassidy was, was terrific. But I want to tell you, I mean, with all due respect, and I think I noticed that um, the Oscar-winning director, Chuck Workman, is tuning into this. So, and, and he knows film sets. Um, 
to be honest with you, they can be bloody boring. They can, because I mean, you're sitting around for one scene. So I used to go there, watch the scene, watch the scene done again, do the interview with the personality, see another scene shot again and leave. And of course in Mexico, it was more fun because I get to, to hang out with the stars and with Paul. It depends. If you go to Greece, you meet Jason Robards and you get a little bit inebriated with him, unfortunately, because the inebriation was his downfall, but that's another story. Um, and so going on the film set, you really don't know. I mean, Torn Curtain, I saw. Torn Curtain, Julie Andrews, I mentioned, kind of bookending it. Julie Andrews, Paul Newman, Alfred Hitchcock. Looked terrific. I don't think it did too well. But anyway, although you saw it. So the answer is uh, watching magic being made isn't as exciting as you think it is, honestly. So that's my no. answer. Yeah, well, I, it would be interesting to hear from Chuck Workman if he, if there's any sort of sign when, when he is directing, what, what is going to, if the movie is going to gel together, because there's so many components yes. of it. All right, well, um, Denise, I know that you are Denise Sindelar, the deputy director of the museum. I know you are tracking the questions. So um, why don't you pass over some, some participant questions to Ivor? Okay. So we have, um, hi from the Ivor Davis fan club from Robert Wilson. What is the backstory to this hole in the wall gang that Paul Newman ran? Well, the interesting thing was gangsters like Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid were part of the whole hole in the wall gang. And apparently uh, the, a villainous band of outlaws were known by that. Then they used to hang out somewhere in the Midwest or wherever it was. But the interesting thing was that Paul Newman then co-opted the Hole in the Wall gang as his charity for children. And um, it was quite a clever thing. A lot of people, I mean, Paul Newman, of course, as many people know, raised huge amounts of money uh, for charity for his Hole in the Wall gang. And also they used to have a camp for kids who couldn't afford to go, handicapped kids, and they called it the hole in the wall camp. Okay. Well, I have a couple of questions um, about what really propelled Paul Newman to take on this whole food, um, uh, creating custom recipes, the salad dressing, the spaghetti sauce. What drove him to that um, line of work? Wait, and by the way, can I just interject? Um, it, I neglected to say this in the beginning. All of you who have questions, please put them in the Q&A at the bottom or in the chat. Denise will check both of them. Sorry. Okay, no so the, the, the question, Denise, was um, what, what triggered the food, uh, Paul Newman's um, uh, entrepreneurship? Is that right? Yes, okay. yes. Well, well, what actually happened was he was a very good friend of a guy called, a writer called A.E. E. Hotchner. And Hotchner, I think, wrote books about uh, Hemingway and he knew Hemingway. And so the two of them got on very well. So one day, apparently, they were having, um, uh, they were having dinner one night in, um, in Hollywood's answer to the In-N-Out Burger. No, I'm exaggerating, it's not In-N-Out Burger. Harley, you know, with, they were having dinner at Chasen's, which was the showbiz hangout where everybody from Sinatra to Ronald Reagan, every movie star goes. And Paul got hold of the salad dressing and said, this is so oily. This is, yeah, now you've got to do better than this. And somehow Hodgson said, well, why don't you make one? Because Paul liked to mess around in the kitchen, on the stove, that is, not, not mess around out the ways. Anyway. Although maybe he did mess around in the kitchen, who knows? Um, and so they decided to come up with Paul Newman's uh, salad dressing, his spaghetti sauce. And of course, Newman being the uh, philanthropist that he was, decided that the, all proceeds from this spaghetti sauce, salad dressing, would go to help these kids, underprivileged, homeless kids. And of course, even today, uh, you can buy his salad dressing. And even today, uh, millions of dollars are funneled 
to Paul Newman's charity. So that was a tremendous idea, which turned into a tremendous success for many, many thousands, probably millions of kids, thousands of kids. Great. Hey, well, you, uh, you did ask the audience to um, do some fact checking. And Jim Heller wants to let you know that uh, Robert Redford is a blend of English, Scottish, and Irish. So there's that answer to that question. So you can call him Mick, can't you? You can call him a Mick, I guess, you know. You, sh but, you sure but, can. Yeah. Go, go uh, ahead. So Jerry Katz is, we have a question from Jerry Katz said he saw the movie as a college junior with his entire fraternity. It defined cool, but for me, the score by Burt Bacharach was a complete delight. Do you have anything to say about how that happened? And was it part of the shoot or just added afterwards? Well, I want to tell you that, to be perfectly honest with you, I'm just having a look for my notes here because raindrops keep falling on my head. Now, it's a lovely little interlude in the movie, but what the heck? does it have to do with the film? <laughs> I mean, th there you are. And there's Paul Newman on his bicycle with uh, Catherine on the back seat doing all these strange contortions. And yet, somehow, I mean, it didn't really take the film any further. It was like dropped in there abruptly. And yet, for Burt Baccarat, I think, and Hal David, it was a smash hit. And they wrote the song. Uh, it kind of uh, it was a, a sort of a joie de vivre song, whatever that means. Um, and I was just trying to see what some of the critics tri critics said because oh yes, um, I, I mean the, I must tell you this because you asked the question about raindrops. Um, the critics didn't go crazy about the movie. It was hugely successful. Uh, over a hundred million dollars, top grossing picture of the year. But as I said, the critics were a bit dubious. Time magazine said the film's two male stars are afflicted with cinematic schizophrenia. One moment they are sinewy, battered remnants of a discarded tradition. The next, they are low comedians whose chafing relationship and dialogue could have been lifted from a Batman and Robin episode. Wow, that was, that was pretty devastating. And Time Magazine said about raindrops, the score was absurd and anachronistic. So, and yet the film won Oscars for the songwriters. It won uh, Best Cinematography, uh, Burt Baccarat and how David, as I said, won. And, um, uh, and I, think, uh, I think the Hollywood Foreign Press gave a, an award to uh, Robert Redford, but not to Paul Newman. So go figure that. Um, and as I said, riding around on a bike in the middle of Bolivia or wherever the hell it, it was, or wasn't Bolivia, wherever it was, uh, has nothing to do with the film, but everybody remembers the song. So thank you for that question. <laughs> so we have a question from Gary Phillips, and he's asking, and in the movie, did Paul and Robert actually jump off of the cliff into the water, or was that handled by stuntmen? Um, I would hazard a guess that they would wanted to jump off into the water 50 feet below, but you've got to be kidding. I mean, when you go on a movie like that, you have insurance coverage. And it looked terrific. It was, a, it was almost like an iconic scene in the movie. But the answer to the question is, if you keep it to yourself, they had stuntman do it. <laughs> surprise, surprise. Okay. Well, that was the last of the questions from the audience. So I think maybe if there's something that you wanna share that hasn't been shared yet, now would be the time. Well, you know, I think I've, I've talked about it and I'm just having a look at my random notes. There's so much stuff about, um, you know, we were talking about uh, the ridiculous things about, you know, who, can you imagine films in Hollywood if, if, if roles that they had played, um, 
that, you, that are so iconic. And I mentioned earlier, for example, surely Jack Nicholson as the Godfather, I'll try to get back to that, and Jack Nicholson as the Godfather wouldn't have worked. And it was Marlon Brando that really was the Godfather, that made the movie, that won him an Oscar. So it's always fun. And, um, and for all you moviegoers out there, you must know great movies. And I bet you that if you came up with your favorite movie, let's see Gone with the Wind. I mean, who did they want for Gone with the Wind before Vivian Lee got the role? I, there were dozens of other, there were like 50 other actresses who auditioned for Gone with the Wind and they finally settled on Vivian Lee. And when you go through, and I was kidding about Elvis Presley auditioning for James Bond, but if, you, if you'd said that to, to Elvis Presley, he probably would have auditioned for it because he wanted to break out of his, of his um, cookie cutter movies that he made. I mean, he made all those movies, 33 movies, Elvis Presley playing the same character with a different leading lady and a, a bunch of different songs. So it's always interesting to contemplate. Um, and I, don't, I mean, if, 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 um, if Chuck Workman is still around, um, uh, and I don't know, maybe it's a bit late wherever, wherever you are, Chuck, um, but he knows, he knows the movie business uh, inside out and lectures about movies at, at Chapman College in Orange County. So um, there's so much to talk about films. I mean, earlier you said, Elena, about going on the, on the film set of, of, of movies, which is, which is terrific. You have a good time when you get to, I mean, I once went to Morocco on a film where there was, uh, I thought, well, this is like the Sahara Desert uh, on, on a bunch of movies. And the great thing was that because the film crew was there, they knew the best restaurants to go to and the best bars to go to. And... And that was fun when you went on a film set. I remember going on the film set for the Steve McQueen, Ali McGraw film, The Getaway. I don't know if you remember that. Well, two things were happening on that film. Number one, Ali McGraw was being stolen away from her husband, Robert Evans, by Steve McQueen. So their love scenes were pretty torrid. And the other thing was that we, you know, after you finished a hard day's shooting you'd go out with the crew to their favorite restaurant maybe you'd have a few drinks with them or a few more drinks with them but they knew the lie of the land and i remember as i say when i went to morocco on on a bunch of movies um i i i, I had a terrific time because uh, you, you, you they knew where to go they had the lie of the land so i would always accept the opportunity to go on film locations because it was like seeing the world at my newspaper's expenses or expense. So, um, so you know, you, I, could, I could go on, and I don't want to go on too long about the fun of covering the movies, of, of interviewing uh, Richard Burton, for example, talk about uh, fabled drinkers. I once went to South Africa, long trip from Los Angeles, Ventura, to see Richard Burton on a film and I want to tell you that the sad thing was that Richard Burton was on the wagon because when he was not on the wagon, he was uproarious. He was fantastic. And Richard Burton at the time, and I know we're not talking about Richard Burton, but he was, um, Richard had just divorced Elizabeth. Remember her? Elizabeth Taylor. And to cut a long story short, he'd married a, a young model called Susie Evans, who, who and his young wife, main job was to keep Richard off the booze. And there I was for two or three days with Richard Burton and, and uh, Roger Moore and a bunch of Richard Harris, another legendary drinker of Hollywood fame. And uh, Roger Moore was cooking dinner for us and telling us rude stories about Prince Charles, the heir to the throne of England, who as we speak is still the heir to the throne of England, right? And if his mother ever gives up the job, I can then say I'd met the future king of England. Anyway, I sort of rambled on a bit. I apologize, but uh, okay. yeah, I've got two, <clears throat> two other one comment and one question. So I don't think that everybody saw this, but Chuck uh, Workman did weigh in early on, 
and everybody has to see this. He said, hi, Ivor, you look so spry. You must have been a baby when Butch Cassidy came out. Save me some of Paul Newman's brandy. Gotta go. Ah. And Jim okay. Heller, who by the way, Jim, uh, I cannot even imagine what it would have been like to not be one of your fraternity and be in that theater when all your whole fraternity was seeing the movie. But Jim wanted to know where the movie was filmed. Uh, the mil the movie was uh, Butch Cassidy. <clears throat> talking about we're talking about Butch Cassidy. Yeah. Butch Cassidy was shot in a, a beautiful, beautiful town called Cuernavaca, Mexico. And why it was beautiful, it had it had these. I'm I'm not an architectural expert, but it had these wonderful old buildings, and it, it, it had a great deal of charm. But it made a lot of money because it doubled. Uh, it, it was cheaper than going to Bolivia, because Mexico is much cheaper than Bolivia. And a lot of Hollywood film studios used to go to Mexico to shoot it. So it was Cuernavaca. And I want to tell you that I also went to Mexico a great deal. And I went to Mexico with another legendary drinker and actor called John Wayne on a movie. So, um, at, so they went to Mexico to make Westerns. And this was a Western, don't forget. And then after Mexico, they ended up going to Italy to make the movies. And you remember what they called the Italian Westerns, Elena? Yeah, Spaghetti Westerns. Spaghetti yeah. Westerns, that was it. So the Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. Yeah, can we yes, do that they, next time? Oh, the Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, yeah. Well, Lee Van Cleef, who played a villain, a villain in all those movies, he had one eye, and he, I met Lee Van Cleef, believe it or not, in Ventura, California, at the sea, at, 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 at the local restaurant, um, anyway, at the Pierpont <laughs> Inn, he used to go there to have that lunch every day. Anyway, I met him and he told me about spaghetti westerns and he played a villain in every single western. And one of the, uh, is a, I, I wish we had feedback, but which famous movie star who is now probably hitting 90 nearly and, um, and um, lives up in Carmel and was the mayor of Carmel made his, go ahead, go ahead, what's the answer? Let somebody Everybody else answer. Knows his answer. All together now, one, two, three. Clint, Clint is Eastwood, right. Yes. So that was, so, so Clint made his break doing spaghetti westerns. So we've gone, we've covered the waterfront. We've gone from spaghetti westerns to Mexican westerns to even American westerns. <laughs> and as you know, um, I think on one occasion I did a lovely talk for the museum and, and mentioned that many great western movies were shot in Ventura County. So on and that, that note, what? And that, ladies and gentlemen, is our end to this episode of Behind the Scenes with Ivor Davis. Ivor, we could talk to you all day. I know everybody could listen to you all day, all night. Thank you so much. You are uh, just a joy. You are really a, you. a ray of light during these kinds thank, of- Thank you so much. And I hope everybody was taken away from uh, our twilight zone of a world, even for an hour. So thanks for coming and thanks for having me. And maybe I'll see you again. Don't know where, don't know when. Thank you all from the Museum of Ventura County. We're so happy to have you with us here tonight and we look forward to seeing you uh, sometime soon. Thank you.